Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. My name is Gail Snyder. I'm the Executive Director for Dementia Friendly Fort Worth. We are proud to offer this program in conjunction with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and United Way of Tarrant County. This is a recorded program, and if you do not wish to be included in the video, please uh, turn off your camera and mute your sound. The recordings are made available so that you can view these at later times through a YouTube channel. And today our guest is Nancy Strickland, docent program manager for the Amon Carter Museum of American Art, and she's going to talk to us about American Impressionism. Nancy, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry to to uh, get ahead of myself. But That's okay. Great to see you. So we're going to look at some of the American Impressionist art that we have here at the Amon Carter Museum. You may be surprised at who might be considered an imp Impressionist artist. And speaking of that, uh, those of you that know a little bit about the Amon Carter Museum, what is it? What was it first known for? What was the type of art that it had first? Do you know? Western art. Yes, Patrick, you're right. It was Western art, and that's all it was. I, I say all. It was an important uh, collection that Eamon Carter himself started, and then he built the set aside the money to build the museum in order to house that collection, but it was Western art. But now it's a broad collection of all types of American art and is known as really one of the premier American art museums in the country. So we're just going to look at one little piece of that, and I'm going to start here by sharing my screen. Yeah, there we go. We're looking at the outside of, of, of the Amon Carter Museum right now in a very modern kind of photograph. And let's just get going here. So this is not in our collection. In fact, <clears throat> you may, uh, of course, if you, if you are um, interested in art and and uh, many people are particularly interested in impressionist art you may recognize this and one of the most prominent in fact the person that impressionism is uh that school of art or that uh, way of, of creating a painting is attributed mostly to claude monet and this what are we looking at here what do you notice it's a little bit hard to make out but what do we see in here A boats, forests. Yep. We can see a boat on the water, and it looks a little bit like we might have some trees in the background, maybe. Yep, a like a on ship. the shore. Yeah. Looks okay. like a ship. A ship, okay. But we're having to sort of fill in some of the blanks ourselves. The name of this painting happens to be Impression Sunrise. Impression Sunrise. And that's where the term Impressionism came about. Uh, the painting is attributed to giving rise to that particular movement. Now, when we talk about uh, American Impressionism, we can't assume that it was exactly like the European Impressionism. It really has some things that are a little bit different about it. And the things that you're seeing on this particular slide um, were used, uh, are, are things that um, were used all across the world in sort of pushing forth that idea or allowing it to happen. And what we're seeing right up here, I bet we have maybe one painter in the group. What are we looking at right here? Oil paint. Yeah, we're looking at tube, tubes of oil paint. That's exactly right. And <laughs> the, the tube for paint was invented in 1841, quite a long time ago. And we think about Impressionism from the latter part of the 19th century, but 1841. And that began to allow an easier transport of paint. Prior to that, the artist had to, you know, take the oils, crush the pigments, put them together. And that was more easily done in a studio. But once we had them in the tube, they were more transportable. And you may have heard the term uh, plein air or plain air. Artists were able to get outside in the air and take their tubes of paint and paint right on the spot. So this had an impact on changing art. What are we looking at right here? Camera. Yeah, we're looking at a camera here. And uh, this is an early um, uh, camera. And, and bringing this about and, and having things look completely realistic through a camera 
maybe pushed people toward making things, you know, not quite as realistic. And also some of the techniques of photography. Any photographers in the group? Okay. All right, Paulette. So you know that one of the things that you do, either when you take the picture or maybe you even developed your own photographs, or maybe on the computer now you do this, you do some cropping. You close things in. You're not like, you know, taking the hole with lots of things around your subject. You crop. So impressionist, impressionism, both European and American, used that, that, that was sort of something new in creating the composition. And then also we're looking at Asian art right here. And Asian art became, um, popular in the latter part of the 19th century all over the world and and we see some of the characteristics of Asian art in um, in our impressionist painting and then finally this little um, drawing here is to represent chemistry so we've got chemistry then uh, allowing us to develop new pigments and vibrant colors and things so these are all four ideas or objects or things that that sort of helped move along that idea of Impressionist painting. And as we're looking at this, I want us to think about how Impressionism is more than an imitation. American Impressionism is not an imitation of French Impressionism. And what were American Impressionists influenced by or interested in? What, were their, what was their subject matter? And how were American Impressionists influenced by cultural and social situations? And we'll see that as we look at some of the paintings now in our collection. So we're going to look at first, this is a painting by really one of the very few female Impressionists, and she was an American. And this person, Mary Cassatt, was from a wealthy American family that studied art in her early life and then also went and studied art in France. And she was accepted by and embraced by the painters in France, which may not have been quite as true in this country. Same thing with um, black artists in Europe. They were much more accepted by the people in Europe than they were in this country. So she studied in France. She was very much influenced by Edward Degas, who was known as an Impressionist. She knew um, um, Monet and other Impressionists. She exhibited with them. And this is in our collection. We haven't had this for a really long time. We've only had it since 2011. And um, this was kind of sort of a lost painting. In fact, it's one of two that, um, that uh, Mary Cassatt did using not oil paint, but sort of a tempera with a glue in it. Um, it dried very quickly. And she and De Degas were experimenting with like getting the paint on the canvas really fast. If you've painted with oils before, I haven't. But if you've painted with oils before, I understand that you have some time. You can rework things. You can do some mixing of colors on the canvas. And, and you know, it, it takes a long time to dry. You can come back and sort of do things over. Uh, but this, this she had to get on the canvas very quickly. So what are we looking at here? What do we see here? Turn your mics on. What's our subject matter? Woman with a fan. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, Patrick? You are going to laugh so much. You know what the name of this painting is? Woman Standing Holding Fan. <laughs> That's the name of it. So you're right on there. Yep, we got a woman with a fan there. And, you know, I said the Asian in influence. Are we seeing that here with the fan? Yes. So that's part of the subject matter here. I also said something that photographers do. What was that that I said that, that photographers often do when they're trying to get, you know, frame and get close to something? Crop. Crop. That's exactly right. So we don't see this whole chair. In fact, we don't even see her whole edge of her dress. It's cropped off at the right. So we're seeing that Asian influence. We're seeing uh, the cropping in this one. We're playing with color and light with this. We're not seeing the clear expression of her face. 
So this was very experimental at the time. It's, it may be something that we're more accustomed to looking at now, but very ex experimental. Something else that Cassatt did that I'm just going to try to explain. It's a hard thing for me to understand. It's And actually, Frederick Remington did the same thing. And other artists, it's called foreshortening, where you're giving this illusion or this impression that things are going into the background. And one of the ways that you do that is by making the object seem more compressed, like the chair and the and the woman just a little bit squatty. Um, it sort of gives us the idea that things are more receding in the background. What's your opinion of this one? What do you think, Paulette? Do you like this one? I love the way they use the contrasting colors to make it much more visual when you look at it because you know how, how red and green are Christmas colors because mm -hmm. they kind of like contrast each other. Mm -hmm. And they've done that right here with mm -hmm. her dress and the carpet. I agree. Y'all think she's going to sit down or she's just stood up? Ah, uh, her dress is caught on the sofa. Okay. I think it does look like she's trying to loosen her dress from the chair or the sofa. You're right. Any or other she's thought? pulling it out getting ready to sit down. Okay, that's right. Could be the other way. She could be like trying to s pull it and smooth it so that so that then she can sit down. So if you when you see if you if you come to uh, enjoy Mary Cassatt and you see some of her other works online or in a museum, you'll see that her subject matter is often these um, subjects of women and children and domestic life, also sort of showing the wealth of her family. Uh, those were her subjects, and she was very, a very popular artist at the time and really spent a good part of her adult life in, um, in France. Okay, let's look at this one now. This is a painting by an artist whose name is William Merritt Chase, and you can see that he painted Idle Hours in 1894. I've got to back up here. I don't think, yeah, oh, of course. You knew this was woman holding a fan. You could see the name <laughs> of it right there. <laughs> okay, sometimes I have the names of the paintings on the, uh, on the screen, sometimes I don't, especially when I'm putting slides together. We're looking at William Merritt Chase, and you know, he painted in many different styles. All of his paintings do not look like Impressionist work, but of course this one does. And let's talk a little bit about some of the qualities of, of Impressionism. I'm going to show you this, and then you can see a little bit more up close here. So if you wanted to make an Impressionist painting, um, you think it would help to, uh, for you to put pencil lines in and draw everything exactly? straight like Demuth did. That was an artist we looked at a couple of weeks ago where he did straight crisp lines. No, you wouldn't do that. You'd be using these quick brush strokes. You'd be mixing the colors right there on the palette. Look at the faces or the lack of faces. Yeah. Yeah, we don't see the details in the faces at all. Let me show you again the whole thing. So where do you think these people are? On the beach. On the beach. Oh, they're the the seaside. People, yeah, Probably in, uh, on the eastern, I say northeastern United States along the coast. You're right. It is northeastern coastline. I've never seen that before, but it must, it, it must look very different. Now, I grew up in Corpus Christi. So if I was looking at uh, the Gulf of Mexico, First thing I'd notice, first thing I'd do if I was painting that is I'd make that water not so pretty in blue. <laughs> so, but, but you know, the, the coastline there doesn't look that different because it is duny and there's grass covered dunes and so forth. But yes, it, it was in the Northeast. Any other thing you notice about this? What about the clouds? I think it's going to rain. Yeah, we look like we could have a little showers. Not, it's not going to ruin the whole day, but is, is the coast a favorite vacation spot for any of you? California. No? No. Yeah. 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 Yes, Paulette? No. Loved it. 
And I'm scared to death of water, so go figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. But yeah, um, some people either love it or they don't love it. I loved it growing up in Corpus Christi, and then I came to not miss it so much. Um, I moved away, and I never moved back there, and I, I don't miss it so much. Interesting thing about this painting. Um, conservators are the people in the museum that take care of the art, that you know sometimes clean it. They study it. They might use special um, uh, X-ray type radiograph processes to look at what's behind the canvas and so forth. It was discovered that there's sand on this canvas. So we know that uh, William Merritt Chase likely painted this outdoors. And we also know that he, was, um, he had a school called Shinnecock and it was a school in the summer uh, on Long Island, so yes, in the in the Northeast, and he spent months painting there. And I just think it's interesting to be able to to recognize that some of the sand that blew in, you know, actually stuck to the canvas. Um, it'd be so fun to be able to touch it, but of course we can't do that. So let's see what we got next. Oh. Now, had, had we been able to be in the galleries today, which I was really hoping to do, we'd have looked at a second painting by D Dennis Miller Bunker. That is a portrait that is a very realistic looking portrait, not impressionism at all. But you can see artists will go through and they'll see new trends and they'll experiment with new things. This is Dennis Miller Bunker's In the Greenhouse. This one, and then he also painted a companion painting called Chrysanthemums. And there was an, a woman whose name was, just a second and I'll get her name. Maybe I will not get her name. She was an art uh, patron in the Northeast that uh, supported artists. And this is her greenhouse. And uh, he, she had De Dennis Miller Bunker visit. This one may be considered a study for something a little more complex. Now, if you squint and look at this, if you just squint, or if you get really, really close to your screen, or in the museum you got your eyes really close, you really don't see anything. You kind of have to back up, and we're getting the impression of what? What are we seeing here? There's a face. Oh, maybe there's a face in there, but what's the actual object you think that the artist was painting? Oh, you're muted, uh, Paulette and Bob. And I thought Paulette was talking there. And I got somebody I can't see now, maybe. No, I guess I've seen everybody. It, would you agree that we're looking at flowers? Yeah, but it looks like there's a dog or a pet or something in the middle of it. Okay, well, maybe, like, are you talking about, like, right in here? Or maybe uh, down here? Well, there's oh, here? A right there, and there's its little nose, and it kind of looks like either a half, half a cat, half a dog. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> well, I think we're, uh, you know, we may see thing. that, and, you know, it is Impressionism. This is the closest, I think, of anything I'm showing you today where we really lose the form of the actual object. Comparing that to Chase, we can really see, they're blurred a bit, but we can see the outlines of the figures, of the bodies there, their hats, the book, the umbrella, the pillow. We can see those things. With uh, French Impressionism, often we we almost lose the form. This is one thing that sort of makes American Impressionism in general a little bit different than French Impressionism. We still see the form. But here, I'm having trouble seeing the form. I'm seeing color, and I'm see, I'm being, I am being given the idea of flower petals, but I am not seeing carefully uh, crafted chrysanthemums like we might in a more realistic still life painting. Okay, let's look now at, oh, this I wanted to tell you a little bit about. So, um, <clears throat> this was an artist colony, colony and uh, it was a boarding house that was owned by a woman whose name was Florence Griswold, 
and some artists in the summer of 1889, so we're, we were, in, we're in Impressionism for some years by now, but they began making plans to sort of turn this into an artist colony. And Child Hassam, I'm gonna show you a work by him in just a minute. He got there in 1903 and attracted many others because he was so well known and people wanted to paint with him and study with him. And he helped transform this into really maybe the most, one of the most known artist colonies in this country, particularly the most known for Impressionism. And an artist colony or artists living and working together was a very common experience in Europe. <clears throat> So the artists showed their appreciation to Miss Griswold by doing what? Let's look down here. You know, I think if I can, if I escape this for just a second, I can move that out of the way. Yeah, so we can see this a little bit better. Ooh, I hope I'm gonna start on the right place. Probably not. Yeah, I did, I'll have to get back through and get back down there. Okay, so this is Mrs. Griswold. This is her dining room. What do you think we're looking at up here? Paintings. Yeah, except that they're not on a canvas. Is it windows? They're, they're on the wall. They're uh, just right on the wall. Wall panels. Mm -hmm. They're on the panels. They're the panels in her dining room. And so the artists that were there, and just imagine the, the um, I mean, very, very important American artists uh, that were there. And this is still there today. You can go and you can visit that today and you can see the panels on the wall at what was the Lyme um, artist, the old Lyme artist colony. It looks like there's also paintings on the upper panels of the door. Does anybody else see that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I didn't, I hadn't yes. noticed those before, Gail, but I see them now, like on the at, upper. At first I thought it was like a reflection but right. it actually is like the same painting because it looks like a big tree. Right. The person yeah, on each side. Is. I'm glad that you can see that so well. I, I didn't know that would be so clear, but I think that's pretty cool. Pretty interesting. Let's go right here. And I said we'd look at a Hassan painting. So have we completely lost form here or do we see a little bit of... We, we know what we're looking at for sure, but this is pretty close to losing form. This looks, you know, the uh, French Impressionism, we often saw street, urban street scenes. Um, we would see um, this wash of the, the sunshine, the rain and so forth, um, sometimes people. It's a little hard. One of the things you can make out for sure is what? The columns. And the flag. Oh, yeah. The columns here of these buildings. Now, if you looked along here, we can see one. Here's another distinct building here. And another distinct building here. By the way, one of these buildings, I believe this right here, was the original Waldorf Astoria, which was later taken down to put up the Empire State Building. But that's what we're looking at there. And we're looking at here um, mm -hmm. some sort of financial or, you know, the columns to me, make me think of like a library or something, but I think it's some sort of financial institution that we're looking at right here. What do you think this is right here? A trolley or a streetcar? Yeah, yeah, a double decker too. You can see those stairs there. We see the people on the sidewalk and then I have a really hard time with what's in the street and I don't know what the right answer is. What do you think? They're all cars. You think they're cars? Yeah. Anything else they could be? The first traffic jam. Okay, uh, <laughs> could be a traffic jam. Uh, could be people. Could be people. At I first, thought, I thought it looked like people holding umbrellas. Mm -hmm. Oh, it that's does. true. Yeah. But the people on the sidewalk don't have umbrellas. Oh, boy, Gail, you are really looking close at this. <laughs> that's right. They don't, you know, and I, I think maybe, well, maybe it's like a parade or something. I don't know. We've got a patriotic scene going on for sure. Um, what do we have? Let's look at the year this was painted, 1916. What do we have going on historically? World War One. Yeah, World War One. But in 1916, the Americans had not yet entered the war. So um, <clears throat> there was this effort in our country to sort of build this patriotic feeling. 
and uh, this interest, I guess, it, an interest in Americans to pay attention to that war because it was likely that we might have to become involved, and of course we did. So this painting was one of more than 30 that was done by Child Hassam, and it is known as the Avenue of, the group of paintings was known as the Avenue of Allies paintings. And um, the hanging of the flags was something that was really happening. Either all American flags like this or the flags of the United States and its allies were hung in cities in this country. And um, this was, uh, may have been, since America hadn't entered the war at that point, it may have depicted um, or comm commemorated the event in 1915 of the sinking of the Lusitania. We don't know that for sure, but that's possible. It is, you know, we talked about two weeks ago, we talked about how artists were influenced by place. And then at the beginning of the session today, we said that, you know, one of the things in American paintings was, you know, we made it American subject matter. We made it about us when it was here. So actually also by how, you know, that the, the uh, Painters are being influenced by what's going on culturally and historically. So this building on the right, I'm looking down at my notes now, is a financial, it's, it's the Knickerbocker Trust Building. So, you know, you think about that as you, you've got flags and then you also have other things that sort of rec uh, uh, refer to like the prosperity of the United States, the, um, the, the, the importance of education and all of those things together when you're looking at a scene like this. Do you like this? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes, it's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I, I included this one. <gasps> Look at Paulette, you love this? I love blue bonnets. Mm -hmm. Oh, you love this artist. Oh gosh. This is Julia Underdog. For a while, we had some property in Brenham, and the whole field in the spring turned into blue bonnets. And oh my God, it was the most beautiful thing in the world. It is beautiful. Does this look real? Yes, yes it does. It does. It's beautiful. I, of course, had to include our Texas impressionist uh, artist, Julian Underdog, whose parents were also artists. And uh, he studied with William Merritt Chase, and that was the artist that, that painted the Idle Hours uh, sea seascape there uh, but we're looking at a texas landscape here and he painted hundreds of these and it, he hasn't always been get, been given the appreciation maybe that that he deserved because there's so many artists that painted blue bonnets but um this is one of this is one of the favorites among the patrons of this museum and i can see paulette loves that as well oh i, I do i do you know i go ahead it looks much more realistic than some of the other impressions. Maybe so. What, but look at the trees back here. What do you think? Are we still seeing some blurred lines and you have to sort of fill in some gaps yourself? Yeah, but it looks more realistic yeah. than some of the others. I guess because our beautiful fields of blue bonnets really do look like this. That's right. They do. Yeah, that's gorgeous. My favorite. It looks, it looks like it's hazy too, a little bit yeah. hazy in the back. Mm -hmm. That's what the, why the trees look a little bit indistinct because of the right. haziness. We got, you can barely make out these hills in the background. Yeah. And imagine yeah. yourself walking along this little path. Yep. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever had the opportunity to, I guess because I've never lived in central Texas to really walk through a huge field of blue bonnets like this, but it sounds like Paulette, you've had that opportunity. Yeah, we did. We, we had a couple of acres and it was just loaded with blue bonnets and every spring we would just run up there and just love it. Right, right. Sometime I'm going to go on that in the spring on that blue bonnet trail, you know, like a driving tour through the hill country where you can, they point out all the best places to see the wildflowers. Just don't pick them. Oh, oh I, I heartily encourage you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just don't pick them. We're not yeah. To pick yeah, them. Yeah, no, don't pick them, no. So who do we have to thank for the, all, the, all the, the, the beautiful flowers on all of our interstate highways and things? Lady Bird Johnson. Yeah, that's right. Lady Bird Johnson. I used to do a children's program that was, a, it was about all the flowers 
in Texas and the, the contribution that she made was included in that. Okay, I've got one more to show you. We're five after here. <gasps> Look, we've come full circle. Who Frederick. are we looking at? Frederick Remington. Frederick Remington. Is this Impressionist? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It is. And you know, Frederick Remington, you can see his life years there. He was born in 61 and died in his 40s in 1909. Uh, he died untimely, had a first appendicitis, or actually he died. He was having surgery related to his, uh, he was having an appendectomy and he died. But he had come, this was painted in 1908, and see, he died in 1909. And he had come toward the end of his career to be experimenting with Impressionism for the last several years of his career, just like many American artists were. And he's taking an American subject and maybe tweaking things just a little bit differently than, than he might have done otherwise. But he wrote in his diary that hard outlines and direct color would no longer be found in his work. Instead, his painting was to be an expression of light. And I just love this one. I love the colors. Probably the, the technology doesn't maybe do complete justice to, the, to standing in front of this one. But I just think this one is as beautiful as any other French or American Impressionist work that we might look at. And we're looking at one of our most known artists, Frederick Rubington. Look at the horse. Can you see the sweat? Yep. You can, just by the work here. The working horse. Yes. And any idea, any of you with, that have any sort of cowboy background, it's a little hard to see the American Indian in the background with his hand across his chest. And you can see this, the cowboy here with his hand up in a curved arch over his head. They're communicating. Any idea what they're, oh, oh, wait a minute. Patrick's going to figure this one out. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> Thinking at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the sign of the Longhorn. Okay. So we've got the title there. But, um, but um, uh, what, what do you think they're communicating, though, related to that? Why would he be giving the the Native American the sign of the Longhorn? Is that a stampede in the background? Good thought. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think we're just looking at brush and things back here in the background. I think this guy has gone ahead of the cattle drive. He's up ahead a little bit, and he's encountered this Native American, and he's letting him know something. So when, those, when our cowboys here in Texas and in other states were driving their cattle north to the railroads, what were they going across? Open prairie. Open prairie, but much of that open prairie was actually was the Indian land ter Indian was Indian territory. territory. That's right. Yeah. So he's letting him know we're bringing Longhorn and the, the American Indian is crossing his arm over his chest and supposedly that, that is his consent come ahead with the cattle. And that's what we're looking at there. We're looking at sort of this request and, and answer back. But I do think Remington's, we have several works in our collection. Actually, this is not the only one that are very much during the latter part of his career where we're seeing his idea of, instead of, of um, those, those um, the direct color and the hard lines, we're looking at an expression of light. And that, that truly is what Impressionism is. So I hope that um, our session today, you enjoyed looking at the artworks. I know yes. Paulette enjoyed the blue bonnets and hope oh, the rest of you- great, I loved it all, loved it. I used to work for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, so. Okay. okay. I had a great time today, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank I you. Hope, I hope we see you next Friday with Aaron and then the following Wednesday with me and we'll be looking at a different aspect of our collection then. Any other comments or questions? You're a sneaky one, Patrick. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody taught you to read. <laughs> All right. I've got a question. Yeah, Robert, Bob. Yeah, just curious about the uh, impact of American Pro Impressionists 
as they might depict periods in history other than this one did so with the beginning of the entry of America into the World War I, but to what extent to artists in that period, and by the way, what year did it start? Did it start with that first painting after post-Civil post uh, post War? And so that, the question is about history and Impressionists. If I understand your, your um, question right, I don't have my screen share there. Let's see. Well, oh, that's okay. Let, I can, let me give it back to you just one second. Okay. Go ahead and you can share it again. Okay. Let me share it again. If, and if I understand right, a second, when you say that first one, you are talking about, and I'm just going to flip back through real fast. Oops. The woman with her dress caught in it. Oh, oh, the, uh, okay, the, okay. You're talking asking, about what, the, what year did American Impression well, make the scene? Was that okay. one of the very first paintings? Uh, Cassatt was not one of the very first paintings, because when we look at when Impressionists kind of began, and the painting that, um, that we attribute to that, that Monet's painting called Impression Sunrise, that was painted in 1876. And oh, 1872, and um, that's when we see it developing in France. And and the Americans were a little later than that. But you're right; that is right after the Civil War. Yeah. So, yes, it's very early on. But I I don't think probably Americans at that point. I think the things they were painting, there were of course things being painted in America that completely related to the Civil War era and the period of time right after that. In fact, we have one in our collection uh, by Winslow Homer that's called Crossing the Pasture. And Homer was a painter who, uh, an artist who documented the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, uh, he spent some years, you know, doing something completely different where he was crossing the pasture as two, it's a real palatial, two brothers, almost hand in hand, going fishing together, crossing a pasture, and sort of the um, brothers, as it were, you know, the brothers fighting each other during the Civil War, maybe the brothers coming back together. So yes, artists are refer referencing uh, history all along, but maybe, and actually, when I think about it, that was right after the Civil War, and some people say that, that Homer might have been, would, I wish I could show you all that painting, because there are parts of it that are just splotchy little things to represent flowers that are sort of impressionistic at the beginning. In fact, when that was first painted, people said, well, that's not finished. That's, that's very crude looking. It's, you know, it, it's not polished, it's not finished. So he might have been experimenting that as well as early as right after the Civil War, but generally a little bit later in this country, but throughout history, you know, we have paintings in our collection that, that reference World War II as well. Maybe not directly, but uh, more indirectly, what's going on in our country, in, in, uh, stateside and so forth. There we go. Here we go. Ah, here it is. I can show it to you. All I have to do is, un all I have to do is unhide this. <sighs> you see this? No. Yeah, so this was painted 1871, 1872, right after the Civil War. And, you know, it. I would not call this an Impressionist painting, and people didn't. But I wish I could show it to you bigger, but I'm afraid. Nope, nope. Uh, click, on the, click on the little at the bottom to put it into presentation mode. There you go. Yeah, but it'll take me back to the beginning. But it shouldn't. I'm not, I'm not oh, okay, nope, good. Uh, Okay, there it is. You can see it a little bit bigger there. This is a new version of, of PowerPoint that uh, was just put on my uh, computer yesterday while I wasn't here. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, okay. I kind of know most of it's the same. But anyway, yeah, you can see, you see that a little bit here, don't you? I'm so glad you asked that question. Who, had, Bob, was that you that asked the question? Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Even the house back here, we're not looking at that real clearly. Actually, the, actually, the stone wall and the cattle in the background are pretty indistinct also. They are, but I'm, I'm glad that you, you can see that clearly enough to see that. I love this painting. In fact, 
in, um, let me think of when it will be, more like the very end of this year, I think around Christmas time, around December, we have an exhibition opening that um, is Homer, Winslow Homer, who's an extremely well-known American artist, and Frederick Rennington, and sort of looking at their their styles and their subject matter and their art um, connected to each other, how they told stories in, in their art. And this one's a fun one to think about, you know, what might be going on here. We, we get a little clue here, Patrick, you, you can't really, you, you're reading this crossing the pasture. Artists sometimes would exhibit their art, not always under the same name. So when this was exhibited at one time, it was called Gone Fishing. So we know they're going fishing because it was called Gone Fishing then, even though later the artist came to be known as, I mean, the work came to be known as Crossing the Pasture. <laughs> you have artists that kind of mix the, like more of the distinct and the impressionist together. You know, like a, a distinct, like a photograph would be kind of in focus and then kind of out of focus. I bet, yeah. I, I, I imagine there are artists that, in fact, yeah. here, I mean, we get, these faces are very clear. Yeah. Not, not photographic like, but they're very no, but, clear. Yeah. And then the flowers and, and the, a lot of the other is a little bit different. That, that bucket is distinction, distinctively yeah. clear. Yeah. Yeah. When I do the long version of this presentation, which I hadn't done in years, I use this one as an early, you know, just to show maybe an artist who was experimenting a little bit. Okay. Well, I'm going to say farewell to you today and I'll see you in a couple Thank of weeks. You. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, well, I, Thank you. Super, super job, super program today. Yep. Thank you. you. Loved it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today. And can you all see my screen now? No. Okay, give me just a minute. I thought I had it. And oh, I, I have to say, I have to say, okay, maybe. Okay, it's coming. You see it now? Yes. Yep. So I'm right. excited to announce that tomorrow is Cookie Conversations. So well, we, well, wait a minute. Tomorrow was not Friday. Mars tomorrow Thursday. is not Friday. Mars. Right. No. Um, because of our partnerships with Eamon Carter yeah. and Texas Winds, right. um, I'm moving some things around okay. so that we can squeeze in our cookie baking day. All right. All right. Good. Thank you. So, and I'm open to suggestions for what kind of cookies we should make tomorrow. Ooh. We've made uh, chocolate no-bake cookies. We have done ginger snaps. And we have done chocolate chip cookies with variations of different types of chips in our chocolate chip cookies. That was the latest. And we did... Um, mini chips, M&Ms, dark chocolate chips, and um, broken dark chocolate chunks in those. You ever done a shortbread? A shortbread cookie? Yeah. But I'm willing to try. I've done sugar cookies. Yeah. Either that or peanut butter cookies? Yeah, peanut either butter one. butter cookies? Either one. I'm, they're all good. Nancy, what's your vote? No, oh, I was good. When he said shortbread, that's my favorite cookie, but I'm going to go. I'll see y'all. Okay. I was thinking, uh, oh gosh, if she <laughs> makes shortbread, I may have to watch. <laughs> bye, Nancy. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks so much, Nancy. Okay, bye. Okay, so, so when tomorrow, you, Thursday, right? Tomorrow yeah. is Thursday, and that's cookies. Okay. Oh, I see. I forgot to change Friday. No. My bad. But it is July 16th, and it's Thursday. Okay. Okay. So um, we'll be when we talk about shortbread, um, our family uses a version of pie crust, a shortbread that we use with strawberries. And so most people have strawberries and pound cake mm -hmm. or strawberries and angel food cake. Mm -hmm. And our family has strawberries and pie crust. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. It's a good Whatever. summer dessert. 
whatever, Gail, you know, okay. you, and it's one from our suggestions, you figure it out and whatever you make is fine with me. Wonderful. All right. Well, we'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. All right, Gail. Great you. afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.